All right. What's up, everyone? You're listening to Faith and Films, the only Christian podcast where you can listen to movies and faith. I am your host, Brojo uh, Save. Thank you for listening. I have a guest, uh, Dr. Vern Poitras. We are here to discuss his book, uh, The Mystery of the Trinity. Uh, and so I guess we'll start with uh, uh, a wide range of questions from simple to more complex. Uh, and so I guess the, the first question I have is, why did you write this book? Uh, who is this book for? And also, how long have you been in ministry? Oh, <laughs> well, let's start with the last part. That's the simplest. Uh, I've been teaching at Westminster Theological Seminary for, uh, well, uh, it's now my 45th year. And um, I taught for a few years before I was uh, ordained as a teaching elder. Now, the, uh, the second one was, why did I write the book and to whom? Well, it, it's written to anybody who is interested in deepening their understanding of God and particularly then of the, uh, his attributes and of God as a trinity. But as to why... That's a little more uh, challenging to explain because among people who believe the Bible, evangelical Christians, there has been in the last decades a controversy over the attributes of God. It's surprising because you'd think that's been settled long ago, but it's arisen uh, because certain people prefer to use a more personal language about God's activity, and other people prefer to use more technical, abstract language. Uh, well, that's only a preference, but the question is, have people on one or both of those sides really compromised or obscured the biblical teaching about God? Well, I'm trying to help both sides and, uh, and to go back to the Bible to do it and to look at the attributes of God uh, in the light of the Trinitarian character of God. Wow. Well, yeah. Amen. Uh, as I was reading the book, there's one thing that I recognize that uh, each chapter, which I have to thank you, uh, this is the only book that I'm aware of um, that is 700 pages long, but very easily accessible. It's written in regular English. It's, it's so that people are under, able to understand, which you have a whole section on uh, defining things and, and how to communicate um, uh, complex uh, things to people. And I think you succeeded at doing that. And one thing that I love about this book is that I wish I could show exactly it, but every chapter here, and I have pencils falling out, but each chapter has a section like, Infinite, infinity in the glory of God, infinity in the resurrection of Christ. And then there's something like uh, inf uh, the glory of God in, re in the resurrection. And there's always infinity implied to us. So I, I like that each section uh, seeks to make it not only how does this work within the Godhead, but but also how does this work with, with us and, and how it is applied to us. And then, of course, there's these really helpful study questions that are really practical and uh, not to mention that these are only three or four pages. So a person can, um, you know, people often joke about the fact that people don't read very long books. But if a person sees that they're completing a chapter within three to four pages, they get a sense of accomplishment. And so they're able to s fly through the book. So I was able to read 50 pages in like an hour or two. And I've never been able to do that with any book. So that that's awesome. So just thought I would, thought I would bring that up. Um, so, uh, how would you uh, define the Trinity? God is three persons. Okay, praise One God. One God, three persons. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, many people seem to believe uh, that uh, the Trinity is illogical. I was speaking to uh, a friend the other day who, who was a Muslim, and he said to me, you know, and, and he wasn't trying to be disparaging, but he said to me, you know, as a Muslim, I, I just have to believe in a God who's logical. And, and, and Christians just believe that uh, God can do the illogical. So, so how would you clean up that, that misconception that, that people have? Well, God alone exists forever, right before ever he created the world. So he is himself. 
not only fully logical, not only fully rational, but the source for all human rationality. So, so it's absolutely the case. You can say God is logical. However, we've got sin that's entered the world. And sin corrupts not only the way we act in the world, but corrupts our minds as well. And you can see that when people fool themselves into worshiping idols. That's a, that's a, a spiritual, a mental corruption. It's not just, uh, oh, my body is sick. <laughs> so that corruption extends to our conceptions of logic. And we want, as rebels against God, we want to be God. We want to tell God what he must be. And the fundamental mistake is to, to uh, try to abolish the distinction between the creator and the creature, right? And by making ourselves God, that's what Adam and Eve did, right? The serpent tempted them, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Well, they did come to experience good and evil by doing evil, but they became corrupted rather than superior. But ever since, there's been that temptation. So I want to say, look, God is infinite, and God alone understands himself completely. And that means there's going to be mystery. None of us is ever going to be able to understand the Trinity in the way that God alone does. And the problem is not submitting to God's own uh, uh, revelation and his speech about himself. Right? So when he speaks in the Bible, he speaks truly, we can rely on it. And if he tells us then that he is one God, we can rely on that. And if, it, if it's clear in the Bible, which it is, that there's a distinction between the Father and the Son and the Spirit, then we must accept that too. And we must say, well, God knows better than I do. But it remains a mystery. And uh, uh, false religions and heresies are always trying to have man replace God, tell God what he has to be like. That's the fundamental problem. Wow, that's that's really well said. And that, um, as I was reading the book, I started to realize that later on in the book when you were talking about uh, anthropomorphisms and God's uh, regretting, you, you brought up the fact that we want to make God uh, like us. We want to we want to tell God who He is rather than let Him dictate to us who He's like. And that that that's really good. Um, so. Uh, <clears throat> So, so then it is the case that you would not say that the Trinity is illogical, uh, but but that um, um, I, I heard Van Til say that um, God never claims these to be contradictory, but they fit within the mind of God, and so therefore they are logical, and so God has communicated that to us. Right. Uh, God is the paradigm for logic. Not only is he logical, but he defines logic. Uh, but the, the problem comes that we we bring our own distorted conceptions um, when we uh, when we are immersed in sin. So we need Jesus to rescue us, not simply uh, from uh, our bodily sins, but from our mental disorders, which includes sins of the mind. Right, right, amen. Um, so. With within the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Um, one question that I was talking to a uh, friend about last week was, "Can you pray to all persons in the Trinity?" I would say yes, but frequently, uh, Christians and in the Bible this happens too. Frequently, people just pray pray to God. That's all right. You don't have to be explicitly thinking about the distinction between persons of the Trinity, because each of the persons is truly God. <laughs> so if you're praying to God, you're automatically praying to all three persons. But in prayer, we've also given, actually through the climax of Revelation in the New Testament, it wasn't so clear in the Old Testament, we've been given further uh, depth to uh, the possibility of our understanding what happens in prayer. So uh, Jesus, for instance, taught us in the Lord's Prayer to address God as our Father. 
So there, the person of the Trinity who is in focus is God the Father. And of course, the other <clears throat> two persons indwell the Father so that they are indirectly addressed. But it's priam uh, primarily the Father who is being addressed when we say, our Father who is in heaven. And we're taught to do that by Jesus. And in the New Testament, it's also clear that uh, we are unworthy of having our prayers accepted to God because of our sins. We must have an intercessor. We must have an advocate before God. And Jesus is that advocate. So when we pray, we pray in the name of Christ. That isn't just, well, I know for some people it's sort of just an expression, right? It, it's thrown out, but it should mean something. It should mean that we're coming to, to God saying, I'm not worthy uh, I, even to, to, for you to hear my prayers, but I want them to be heard for the sake of Jesus Christ, who is my perfect advocate. He is the one who stands before the Father and opens the way for me as an imperfect and sinful person to come into the very presence of God, a wonderful thing. That happens through Jesus as the second person of the Trinity. So we, now we're getting a distinction. And in Romans 8, it's revealed that the Holy Spirit is given to indwell us and to shape our prayers, to pray with us, as it were. So it talks about the Spirit interceding for us with groans too deep to be uttered. That's in Romans 8. So it's the Holy Spirit who instructs us how to pray. So there's, there's interaction of all three persons of the Trinity in their distinctive roles, as well as just saying, you're just praying to one God. You're not having to split your allegiance as if, like the polytheists do, right? So, so you offer some sacrifice to Zeus and some to Aphrodite and some to Poseidon and, you know, on and on right. in the mass that polytheism is, and it disintegrates people. Because right. they're meant, we are constructed by God to have a unified allegiance to him as one God. So that's a wonderful thing about the Trinity, because we need all these things, right? We need God, who is all-powerful, to pray to. We need an intercessor. We need an instructor inside of us to shape our prayers. And people who are guilty, who acknowledge that I'm really messed up by sin, this is what we need. We need Trinitarian salvation. And that's right. one reason right. why the other religions of the world really don't have a solution to the deepest problems of sin. Wow. wow. Well, so then my, my, so then my one of the questions I'd like to ask about that is uh, when we uh, pray to Jesus, because I, I heard one person say that when we're praying to Jesus, we can't pray to him as man, but we have to pray to him as God. And I didn't understand if, if a Christian should be actively thinking about that when they were praying. Should we be saying, well, Jesus, now I'm communicating to your deity. Now we're communicating to your humanity. Uh, how do you how do you see that? Right. Well, I think the main thing to understand is we're going to mess it up because of sin. We're not going to get it completely right. But God understands that. That's why Jesus has been sent to be our Redeemer. So our messy prayers are going to be cleaned up by Jesus and by the work of the Holy Spirit internally so that they are accepted. And God hears us. And he answers our prayers. Sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes the answer is not yet, <laughs> right? But he hears us, and we can have confidence if we belong to Christ. We can't have confidence if we don't, because then we don't have an advocate. So all that is true, and that means that when the, 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 you pray to God, you just let it loose, right? You just frank with him, and you just tell what's on your mind. Don't worry too much about getting everything right because you'll never get everything right while you're in this life right now in terms of the humanity and the deity of christ i'd say we pray the person of christ there's only one person the person right. of christ and that person has two natures divine nature and human nature so that we, when you pray to the person of christ you're acknowledging intrinsically mm -hmm. that is in the background not necessarily explicitly 
that it's the one person with two natures. Wow. And because he's wow. divine, he can hear your prayers as God and answer them. Wow. And because wow. he's human, he can be our substitute. You need both of those things. I need both of these things. I mean, we're, we're talking about a universal need. Thank Nobody you. is exempt from this. Wow. Amen. Wow, I almost found myself clapping, but I don't know that people want to hear that over the stream. <laughs> um, so you, you've hinted at this, uh, that we need a triune uh, savior. How does the Trinity, um, and you write about this in your book, how, how does that work in our, in, in our sanctification? How are all three persons active in, in sanctifying us? Uh, right. Well, to be sanctified is to grow more holy progressively over time. And it does take time. And we have to learn perseverance. We have to learn patience. Uh, but it's God the Father who sends the Spirit in us, to, uh, who is the Holy Spirit, right? So he works holiness in us. And in working holiness in us, that's after the pattern of the holiness of Jesus. So 2 Corinthians 3.18, for instance, talks about we are all beholding the face of the Lord we are transfigured into his likeness from one degree of glory to another. That's talking about what's happening now. It's not simply uh, what is to come, although there's uh, uh, great promises of God that we will be made perfect and we will stand before him in glory in the new heaven and the new earth. Those are wonderful promises, but it's already beginning to happen now. And it's the work of the Father in sending the Spirit and, and conforming us to Christ. So it's all three of those. Wow, that's awesome. That's awesome. All right, I wrote, because uh, I, I just love, I, I'm familiar with the term perichoresis, and I, I love, it, just the word itself is just amazing to me, coherence. Would, would you mind defining that, and, and, and how does that play out? Right, well, the word coherence is a technical term that has been chosen as a summary, as a kind of memory hook for something that the Bible teaches. It doesn't use that word, but the Bible teaches that each person of the Trinity dwells in or is in each other person. So you'll find several times, actually, we could go through it if there were time, several times in, in uh, John 14 to 17, you will meet this uh, language of uh, the Father in me and I in the Father, right? Well, that's saying that the Son dwells in the Father or is in the Father, and the Father is in the Son. And you also see uh, John 14, 23, for instance, that both the Father and the Son come to dwell in us, and that's through the Holy Spirit. So you can also infer that there's a dwelling of the persons in one another, including the Holy Spirit. Each of the persons dwells in each other person. And then the glory of redemption is you know, that the persons come to dwell in us. That's taught in those same chapters. And that is what brings genuine spiritual unity to Christian believers, that they wow. may become one, Jesus says in John 17. I and them and thou in me, that is the Father in me, that they may be one, and that the world may know that you have loved me you know, as, I, uh, as I've loved them. So it's, it's a unity uh, in love and in intimacy that is parallel, that is analogous to this eternal unity of mutual indwelling in the persons of the Trinity. Now, this is mysterious. It's mysterious. If you become a Christian, you experience the fact that the Holy Spirit dwells in you. But it's mysterious. It, it, the Holy Spirit is, is not the beat of your heart. It's not the, the, the movement of digestion in your son, the stomach. He's divine, right? So he's he's other than all those things, but he's right there intimately guiding you and transforming you into the image of Christ. Wow, um, amen. That, that, that's amazing. So now how does that um, apply to us? Because as, as I was reading this section, I realized, wait a second, that clears up for me some of the some of the verses in the Bible that seem to suggest that the Father um, is is dwelling with us, but because of the the doctrine of coherence, uh, the Lord is able to do that because the the Father dwells in the Son, the Son in the Father, and and, and vice versa. Yes, in um, in those same passages 
passages of John, Jesus says he will send another helper to be with you forever and that he will dwell in you. So the, the, in most immediately, you can say most directly, it's the Holy Spirit that comes to dwell within us. But as John 14, 23 says, that, that if a man loves me, he will keep my word. My father will love him. And we, that is the father and son, will come and make our home with him. So that's the language of the dwelling of the father and the son. How does that take place? Because they come with the Holy Spirit. They're never, the persons are distinct, but they're never separated from one another. Amen. All right. So very easy question. Um, are there any syllables or uh, posters? I've seen printouts. Sometimes people have lamentated guides that, that you could recommend that we could we could possibly get a hold of so that we're, we're able to memorize these terms and, and not lose them. Yeah. Well, I mean, I have some diagrams in my book, as you know. Sure. But, but uh, the thing about special terms like coherence is that it's intended to be a memory hook that will summarize what people come to know in the Bible. So it can be convenient. I don't have a list myself, but, but uh, what I recommend above all is that we continue reading the Bible. The Bible is God's very word. It's infallible. It's true. It's trustworthy. That's where you ought to be. And any special terms like coherence are not to be a substitute for the primacy of the Bible. Wow. Right, right. So um, I want to go back uh, a little bit to you brought up the creator creature distinction. Um, can you explain what that is and, and how this applies to God's love and other attributes? Okay. Well, all right. So God always existed. In the beginning was the word. Is it, it, that, that's saying not only that God existed, but he existed in a differentiated way. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So you already have not only one God, but two persons. So, and that's in the beginning. That is before every anything existed other than God. So that's what we mean by the creator. Now, uh, then at a uh, he, he did undertake to create the whole world. And so that's Genesis 1, right? So he creates a world. Everything in the world is a creature. And one of the purposes of Genesis 1, really for the multiple cultures of this world, is to give us a clear message, message that God alone, who is the one God who made everything, he alone is to be worshipped. He alone is to be sought for the ultimate satisfaction of personal intimacy. Not any creature. Don't treat any creature as if it were on the level of God. And of course, this was a constant temptation in the ancient world, and it's still with us today in some of the cultures of the world. And it is there among atheists, because the atheists think of matter often. They're materialists, many of them. They think of matter as the ultimate stuff. And matter, or some equivalent, is virtually treated as if it were the ultimate stuff, and therefore you're treating it like God. You have a substitute God, but the trouble is your substitute God is only a creature. It's something God made. And so your allegiance is misdirected. And so the creator-creature distinction is absolutely vital for true religion. And as I mentioned, Adam and Eve, that was their fundamental mistake. I mean, you can explain it in various ways, right? They didn't trust God. They listened to the serpent and his lies. They were proud about, you know, you can go on and on about what, what was their problem. But one way of construing and understanding the problem is they tried to be God, right? Because they wouldn't listen to God. We will be the God like. And the serpent, right, was trying to, to um, deceive them into that. You will be like God knowing good and evil. So, so one of the aspects of sin is that we want to be our own Lord and master. We want to rule our own life, independent of anybody, including the one true God, despite the fact that he alone has all the wisdom about how your life should be conducted. I mean, when you think about it, this is utterly foolish, right? You're going to abandon the person 
who knows completely and exactly what it means to live a wise and a fruitful life. You're going to abandon him and you're just going to go your own way and make it, you're going to make a mess. And if you go and you talk to the people of the world, one and all, if they would admit it, they're all messes. You know, they all mess up their lives. I mess up my life. But God has opened my eyes to see that I'm messing it up and to be willing to say, I need you, <laughs> right? I need to get back on track through Jesus Christ, the Savior. Amen. And I need Amen. him to be my Lord, to be my Savior, to be my guide. I need to follow him and his teaching and his ways, but also to be empowered to change. It's not simply Christ as an example. There's some people who make that mistake. It's I need to be empowered by the power of his resurrection because he was raised from the dead. And he's there to deliver us from the curse of death. So it's all those things that go into it. And it's utterly foolish to try to escape God, but that's what we do. So the creator-creature distinction is in back of it all, right? To, to say, to come to grips with who God is as creator is to say, that's where I'm going to find my rest. It's the only thing that makes sense. And, and the corruption of that, when we try to make ourselves God, is the fundamental sin. Oh, wow. So, uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, when I asked the question about the, the labels or the syllabus or something like that, that we, we don't want to uh, make any replacements for the Bible. Uh, and so, uh, on page, I believe, 190, you state, uh, so also with technical, uh, with other technical terms, they are valuable and we should value them, but they do not replace the Bible or give us something innately superior to or deeper than the Bible. Um, what do you mean by they are not innately superior or deeper than the Bible? Right. Well, they're summaries of the Bible. The Bible is the very word of God. You can't be wiser than God, right? <laughs> you, you can't do better than the way he describes himself and reveals himself in the Bible. So all this theology is to be built on that and to send us back to a deeper contemplation of the Bible. Now, if people want, I was thinking, you know, about these technical terms. If you want to go, for instance, to Louis, Louis Burkhoff, a manual of systematic theology, that's a, 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 a simplified introduction, and you can take the, the, the part about God, right? And, and that will be a good introduction for many people. Or you take a, something that's written even more recently, J.I. Packer, Knowing God. It's a good introduction. There, there will be some technical terms, but, but most of the time they're talking, this is what the Bible says, right? Which is what they ought to be doing. Right. Uh, so, d would you say that Christians don't have to use any of the technical terms? I, I remember talking to uh, uh, Frame, um, uh, or Dr. Frame, about this, and he he brought up the fact that you know, um, you know, Christians don't have to be so stressed out over this kind of stuff. So, so what 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 do you uh, think about um, using technical terms? Do they need to be applied at all? If you have a person in the church who uh, mm -hmm describes the Trinity, but they don't use any of the technical terms. Uh, how can technical terms be helpful and where aren't they necessary? Uh, right, yeah. Well, they are helpful. Let's let's start with that. They are helpful for three reasons. And I talk, as you, you've been reading my books, so you know. Uh, but one reason is that they are a summary. They're a kind of what I call a memory hook. Yeah. Uh, right, as something to hang on uh, as a, a reminder of an entire body of teaching in the Bible. Uh, so, for instance, if we say that God is omnipotent, right? Omnipotent means all-powerful. But that's a summary to think about it. There's tons and tons of passages in the Bible that illustrate God being all-powerful and doing whatever he wishes in the world. So, to say God is omnipotent is correct, 
but it isn't better than reading the whole Bible and just being overwhelmed. <laughs> okay. So, so that's the kind of way that, that you think of, of any technical term. So the one thing is, yeah, it's a memory summary. The second thing is that it's a kind of doorway into the history of doctrine because people, godly people have been writing about the Bible for centuries. And it's much of it is valuable material. It's not infallible, right? Only the Bible is infallible. It's valuable material. These were people whom God raised up and he gifted with the Holy Spirit. So we can profit from reading those people and the technical terms come along with that, right? Because they begin to be developed in the history of doctrine. The third thing about the technical terms is that they are guards against heresy. Frequently, technical terms are crafted in the first place because heretics are teaching not only falsely, but, but destructively. There are things that are so false that they're destructive to the soul. You know, not everything, you know, you can make a mistake about, oh, I thought jo Josiah was nine years old when he became king. Well, actually he's eight years old. Oh, that's a mistake. I'm sorry, right? But right. that's not a soul destroying mistake, right? But if you say Jesus is not God, but only a creature, that's going to be a soul destroying doctrine because it's only God that can save us. And if Jesus is not God, then we're wrong to worship him. Wow. So it, it, that's going to take apart biblical religion if you have you know, an error in that way. So the heret, the heret, to guard against heresies, people have made these technical terms to say, it's almost like a, a, a one of these road signs, right? Of a bridge out, don't go down there. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> and, uh, and, and the technical terms have that kind of function. So all those things are good, but all those things are in the end pointing us back to the Bible, right? And in the end, if you're going to stand and try to protect the church from heretics, you've got to be able to go back to the Bible because the heretic can always just say, well, you have your technical terms, but I have the Bible. Well, he doesn't have the Bible. The right. Bible is not on his side. But to deal with that kind of claim, you do have to go back to the Bible. Oh. So, so that, and so I have to say, well, the technical terms are not absolutely necessary, right? It's the Bible that is absolutely necessary uh, and, and, and it is sufficient to equip the man of God for every good work. But the technical terms, you know, we can benefit, right? We, we're blessed by the Christians of other generations. Right. Yeah, you, you really, really great point that you, you made here. And you, you also said on uh, page 191, you said, on the one hand, it may not catch the true heretic using technical terms because he hides his own meaning under the cloak of an orthodox term like we, we so often see Mormons do. They use all the same terminology, but they mean something totally different. Uh, conversely, it may lead to a, a too hasty decision to brand a fellow believer as a heretic merely because he does not use the same key words in the way that someone else does. Um, yeah, what, what are some, yeah. Excuse me, but if I may illustrate just one other way, John Owen wrote a short discourse on the doctrine of the Trinity. And this was in the 17th century. I've got my dates right. And he didn't use technical terms. And one of the reasons why he didn't, because the heretics of his time were saying, we don't like the technical terms. We want the Bible alone, All right? So he says, okay, I'm gonna use the Bible and I'm gonna persuade you from the Bible that God is one God, that the Father is God, that the Son is God, that the Holy Spirit is God, that the Father is distinct from the Son, that the Son is distinct from the Spirit. He goes all, he goes verses and verses, all right, to establish these things. There's no technical terms, right? And that's just a demonstration, which is very when you're dealing with that kind of heretic. It all depends, right? Yeah. But with that kind of heretic, Owen saw you know, I need to be very basic. And I mean, to be very direct and to wow. say, here's what the Bible says. Right, right. Wow. wow that, that's really good. Um, 
so so you gave an example of how um, we can be too too quick to, to brand someone as a believer. That's interesting because I, I was I was attending a fellowship called I think the, the One Way International. I'm sure you're familiar with that. And on their website, they don't identify themselves to deny the Trinity or anything like that. And they use language so technical. And I found myself uh, thinking, oh, this is a Christian group. And then I started attending the place. And over time, I started to look at what's happening here. And so when I had a conversation with, with a friend and I said, hey, I looked up Victor Paul Werewolf and I, I see that he has a book called uh, Jesus is Not God. And my friend responds, yes, and he has many other great books too. And I went, whoa. And so then I pulled open or pulled up their website and realized, wait a second, there's a reason that they aren't mentioning that Jesus is a God. They always want to say he's the son of God. They, they never want to go beyond that. And so I think that I think that's really good. Okay, so how should we think about, um, I guess we should define these terms, um, but, but how should we think about eminence and transcendence um, and how they are interrelated? Okay, well, transcendence means God's exaltedness, his superiority, his absoluteness. And, and uh, it, rather than just use, you know, very abstract terms, you can you can make it concrete. You can say, look, in Genesis 1, God created everything. That shows his magnificent greatness. Right? That shows his transcendence because he transcends any, he's superior to anything that you look at in this world. Amen. And he continues to govern this world. So you talk about the doctrine of providence. It's just essentially saying God is continually involved in the world, but he's involved as the Lord and creator and ruler. Well, those are, that's the language then of his superiority to the, all the world. That's what we mean by transcendence. Now, the same kind of thing occurs here that people can mean different things by that word. And so you do get false conceptions of transcendence that say God is, is uh, inaccessible. He's unknowable. Well, he's made himself known, friends. <laughs> he speaks to us. He's shown who he is by creating the world. So, so no, that's not what transcendence means. Right, right. So then there's the word imminence, which has to do with the fact that God comes close to us. Now, the Holy Spirit in Genesis 1-2 is uh, described as hovering over the face of the deep. Well, that's picturing the imminence of God. He's right there. He's present. He's present in all the world. Psalm 139 talks about where shall I go from your presence, right? And the, the answer is clearly nowhere. Anywhere I go, you're there. Right. So he's present in the world. And he's present, not simply some part of him, some aspect of him. Everything about him is present at every point in space and at every point in time this is mysterious right and his eminence is actually an implication of his transcendence if you think about it it's precisely because of god's superiority that he can fully control the world and he controls it by being there so these things actually go together they sometimes people say well he's far away right that's transcendence and he's nearby that's eminence but then you make it sound more paradoxical than it is. It's right. precisely because of his superiority that he's able to be everywhere at once. Right. Right. So um, there has been, without question, uh, that throughout the centuries, people have tried to bridge the gap between God's immutability uh, and God's uh, regret that, that we see in the scriptures. Uh, you stated that the answer is rooted in uh, and, and you didn't use these exact words, but I'm summarizing it. You, you say that the answer is rooted in the mystery of the Trinity. Any other attempt seems to fall into unbiblical transcendence and unbiblical eminence. Uh, you argue, I think, persuasively in your book on page 144, when you were giving the example of Don and you were dealing with the open theist and you were dealing with, um, uh, let's see, um, was it the Molinist perspective? I don't remember the other perspective, but you state, uh, Don thinks that regret must always mean precisely the same thing, namely human regret. All the details that go into human regret uh, in the case of human regret. So, so other 
And so that's uh, one issue and, and that I've seen recently uh, going um, on and I've seen and uh, the, I know that there was a recent controversy um, that I'm, I'm not sure if you want to comment on, but I, I will just state the ideology or the, the theology. But, but others seem to think that, that uh, God has taken on separate properties to relate to people. Uh, and you state that the issue is that there has become unbalanced interpretations. Um, so explain the some of the unbalanced views and, and, and how we can uh, bridge the gap there. Because as I was reading this, um, I was saying, okay, what is Poitras? What is he going to say about God regretting? Because I'm hearing people debate about it. And I'm hearing one view espouse from uh, different reformers that I'm thinking of. Uh, other reviews, uh, other, um, sorry, uh, other positions. And, and as I was reading it, I went, oh, this makes sense. Th this, this makes sense. So can you, can you uh, explain uh, um, <clears throat> some of the unbalanced in interpretations and some of the unbalanced views and how we bridge the gap there? Right. Well, yeah, now let me begin with the detail. Um, in First Samuel 15, verse 11, God says to Samuel, I regret that I have made Saul king. A and then, um, in verse, let's see, it, it's, uh, it, it's later on in the same chapter that uh, he says uh, the, 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 that the Lord does not have regret. Um, and now I can't find it, but the, the, the uh, let's see, it's a, uh, you write, uh, yeah, it's a verse 29, yeah. I couldn't find it. It's also the glory of Israel will not lie or have regret, for he is not a man that he should have regret. Well, God, in writing that chapter, understands he's posing a problem to us, right? So he seems to be saying the opposite in two different verses. But if you so, so partly you have to deal with the chapter and look at it carefully and the way the thought of the whole chapter unfolds. But if I may step back from those details, the fundamental mistakes are that either we go in the direction of bringing God down to size. So that if the Bible says that God regrets, then it must be exactly like human regret, right? That he didn't know, right? And then on the basis of better, better knowledge, he changes his mind, that kind of thing, right? So we picture it that way because that's, that's the typical way it would happen with a human being. But from the very beginning, God has said, I'm not a human being. I'm not man, right? That he should lie or the son of man that he should have regret. So, so he's saying right there, look, don't think of me as just a human being blown up to a superhuman size. So, so there's mystery there. The second mistake is in the opposite direction of saying that God is so different from us that we can't really say anything accurately about him, right? So there you get a remote God, uh, a God of darkness that, that you can't come to know. Well, God makes himself known in the Bible, and he makes himself known clearly. He speaks clearly to us. And if he says, I regret that I made Saul king, he means it. And if he says that he's angry, he means it. But what he means is qualified by the fact that he's God. So it's not going to be exactly parallel to us. Well, what happens very briefly in 1 Samuel 15 is understandable. He regrets he made Saul king because Saul has made a mess of it. Saul has sinned repeatedly. He's shown himself not to be a good king. So it's actually a judicial evaluation, which is one of the prerogatives of God. If right. you think about it, right? God is the judge of all the earth. Are you going to say to God, I can't, you can't make a judgment uh, on the basis of of the performance of somebody like Saul. Now, God, we know enough about God from the rest of the Bible to know God knew from the beginning every detail of the life of Saul, just as Psalm 
139 confesses all of my days were written in your book before ever there was one of them. Wow. He knew it all. He's not taken by surprise. That's part of who God is too. Although we can express it in ordinary words. And because of that, we have to say what's happening with God's regret is this judicial evaluation. He's looking and saying, I'm going to remove you from king. I established you as king earlier. That was fine. Right. right? You had the chance. But now that you've done repeatedly these sinful things, I'm removing you. And he's not going to change that. And that's part of the point, too. So God is unchangeable in terms of his plan. And he's unchangeable in terms of his character. And it's precisely because of who he is, the righteous judge, the ruler of all, that he acts in the world in such a variety and an enormous amount of surprising ways that so the world is changing all the time, right? And God is acting in the world and bringing those changes about, but he's the same. Now that's very different, you see, from a polarization where you say if God is immutable, then he's immobile. He can't do anything. Right. That's where you go. If again, you picture God as being remote, right? Uninvolved, supposedly in order to protect his absoluteness, but it it it's not biblical. The God right. is all is continually involved in the world as the same God all the time. Right, right. Yeah. No, that, that that's that's exactly right. Uh, that we are letting the Bible, I believe you're saying, uh, define who God is. Let God define who He is. And so, uh, there is a view um, that that I've seen debates around um, concerning God's regret. That that there is a view of covenantal properties. And uh, I saw in, 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 in reading what you wrote that, that you were saying, you know, some of the reasons that we have some of these kind of interpretations is because we, we want to bring God down into our circle. And we, we aren't saying that God can remain who he is while doing those things. Uh, so what are, your, what are your thoughts on, on views like covenantal properties? Yeah, I, I think it's a kind of unfortunate term. Because the term properties suggests to many people the idea that you can stick new variations onto God himself so that would change who he is, right? So his properties change. So once he was omnipotent and now he's no longer omnipotent or that kind of nonsense. That's nonsense. God is the same God. So he has the same attributes from the very beginning to the end. So the term properties, I think, is unfortunate because it suggests that to many people. But what what could be get what the person could be getting at, and you see, this is the reason to ask, well, what's what's behind this? What it what's really meant by it? What they can be getting at is God acts in the world. So at one time, he he takes the people of Israel down to Egypt in, in the time of Joseph. And then 400 years later, he delivers them from Egypt and he brings the plagues one after another. Well, those things are things spread out in time and space. So he does one thing at one time and another thing at another time. So the way we describe him changes, right? We describe it as, well, now God is bringing the plague of, of blood. The Nile turned to blood. Right, so the way we describe him then is different than saying, "Well, now he's bringing the plague of frogs." Is God the same God? Of course, he's the same God, right? So, so I think there are other ways of talking about the fact. Let's list more clear way, clearer ways of talking about the fact God is is intimately involved in the world. He's acting in the world, but he's the same God. That that's the way that I want to explain it. Now, earlier you asked me about how that's related to the Trinity. It's it, everything goes back to who God is. And God is not only the same God forever and ever, but he's an active God forever and ever because the father loves the son. And there's this doctrine of the eternal begetting of the son, which is mysterious. The father fathering the son forever, not as an act in space and time. So God is eternally active. There's eternally speech of God, right? Because the second person is the word. So there's eternal activity, and that eternal activity is being reflected and manifested 
when God acts in the world. So he's the same God as he ever was. <laughs> but now we see who that yeah, God is because who he is is reflected in his actions in the world because he's an active God. He's always a loving right. God. Right. So on page 185 of your book, you state, and the passing of generations has additional usefulness uh, because uh, if we go back far enough in time or we go to another culture existing ever in our own time, we find that the other people we meet are not preoccupied merely with the pressures of modernity and contemporary life. We get perspective. It helps us to overcome the modern prejudice that newer is always better. And so the question following that is, uh, what happens when one interpretation of God's uh, word contradicts uh, early church history and its practices, uh, can that be sufficient to say that the early church was wrong in what they had practiced? M maybe people that had maybe descended the, the Apostle Paul. Yeah, absolutely. The Bible alone is the infallible word of God. And the church, valuable as it is, and the church leaders can make mistakes. They can teach falsely, right? So if the Bible says it's true, then you must be willing to overthrow and negate anything else from any time whatsoever. However, I would say to the young upstarts, be careful and be humble, <laughs> right? Because doctrine was not born yesterday. And you need to look very carefully then at what God has gifted people to understand in other centuries and other times and not just be carried away, you know, with your own excitement and the excitement of your own times. So when there's an apparent discrepancy between what the Bible teaches and what the church has was teaching, let's say, in the, the fourth or fifth century A.D., then you got to look very carefully at the Bible to make sure you've understood it correctly. And you've got to look sympathetically at what those people in the, the fourth or fifth century were actually saying, right? And even if you reject some of it, there's going to be grains of truth in it that you ought not to neglect. One of the things that frequently happen, happens is this, you know, it's this, this little maxim, don't throw out the baby with the bathwater, right? So people get irritated with certain things about the early church, and it's not perfect, right? And, and the way in which people dealt with controversies, we can sometimes quarrel with, even if they were, their doctrine was right. Uh, either they didn't fight when they should fight, or they fought with earthly weapons, right? Or they fought in a mean spirit, that happens today as well. I mean, we're not exempt. So, so yeah, we can criticize that. So we say, that, you know, the bathwater is dirty. The bathwater of church history is dirty, the whole thing. So just throw it out. Well, where's the baby? <laughs> right? And so we've got to respect the fact that God was at work, even in the midst of much sin. It, you know, if people need something to convince them of that, look at the book of Judges. I mean, the book of Judges is just a horror case of how bad the people of God can get. Right. And God didn't totally abandon them. So I think we got to respect the fact, you know, God does work through imperfect people. I'm an imperfect person. I hope people will read my book, right, even though that I'm imperfect. So we, we've got to have some sense of, of proportion, right. right, and also continually thank God that he's giving, given us an infallible Bible. I mean, what would we do? I mean, think about it. Wow. What would we do if the Bible were subject to the same vagaries oh, yeah. as everything else, well, then we have no place that we could go to sort it all out. Right. Yeah. Paul, Paul says, uh, Paul the Apostle says in 1 Corinthians 5, 9 through 11, I wrote to you in the letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. By no means did I mean the sexually immoral people of this world or the greedy people and swindlers or idolaters since since then you would have to depart out of the world but now i've written 
to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he is sexually immoral person or a greedy person or an idolater or an abusive person or a drunkard or a swindler with such a person not even to eat. And, and the reason I quote that verse is because um, it, Paul seems to be clearing up a misconception of one of his letters. And I love that you uh, pointed out the fact that we need to go back to the scriptures and say, okay, what, what am I reading here? What does it say here? Rather than, well, church history seems to indicate this and and therefore we're going to throw out the interpretation that seems to be clear on its face but but then at the same time it, um, encouraging people who are younger uh, just starting to to read the bible to not overlook uh, church history so i think that's good so uh you wrote um the father sends the son into the world to accomplish redemption the idea is so I, I wrote in response to that. You said the, the idea of sending oh no, sorry, the idea of sending the sorry, the idea of sending presupposes that the father has already determined a, a mission for the son. This is what you wrote. What the son accomplishes is what the father has planned. The Holy Spirit applies the accomplishments of the son to those who are united to the son by faith. So we have three aspects, planning, accomplishment and application. Um, so this language as i was reading it i started to think this seems to suggest that there are potentially three wills or three minds within the godhead how, how would you how do you resolve that that conflict what, what do you think um about that yes right well yeah, john owen dealt with the same thing uh when he was differentiating the distinct roles of the persons of the trinity and at the beginning he sort of says well you know we can't separate these so but we can stress the fact that preeminently and and more prominently a certain person of the trinity is singled out as having a special prominent role for instance in the planning right in the planning of redemption if the father sends the son then he is distinct in the sending and the son is the one who was sent but this is mysterious. And as for the, the one mind or one will versus many, uh, that too is mysterious because we're tempted to say, well, God is like us. Whereas actually we are like God, right? God is the original, right? We're made in the image of God, but we can't reason upwards with, with um, mastery. Right, as if we would make God completely like us in every respect. So each of us has one mind and one will. Right. Right. So you say, well, there are three persons in God, therefore there are three minds and three wills. Except there's only one God. <laughs> right? right. And it's clear in many instances of the way the Bible talks that God has a unified will. And when when you know, in those passages that just talk about God without differentiating the persons. It's clear that God has a unified will. So I think it's safe to say there is one mind and one will and one plan. And in fact, everything in the plan of God is unified, right? Because he's in harmony with himself. So we'd say that, but we also say, and this is what your passages are bringing out, that there's a mystery about the participation of the distinct persons in their distinct personal way. So the way in which they participate or have the mind of God is somehow distinct. But that's a mystery, right? We can't picture it because there's nothing in the created world, including our own minds, that would be a totally one-to-one -one model for God. If there were, you see, that would destroy the creator-creature distinction, right? It would undermine what we've been talking about all the time. Right. Nothing in creation is an exact and masterful model for God. And that includes the discussion of, you know, one mind and one will. But the oneness is important because the Bible stresses there is one God. And that one God, you know, carry out, he carries out his will, right? Right. He has thoughts in, the, in his mind, and then he, he uh, speaks his thoughts. So there's a coherence to that, and the unity is important. But it's also, we do have this language that shows 
the distinctive way in which each person acts and each person addresses the other person. So it's wonderful, but it's only wonderful if you don't try to master it, right? If you try to get on top of it and die, right, you'll right. just be frustrated. Right. But that's not our role, you know? If you remember, I'm a creature. I'm gonna enjoy what God is saying about himself and, and the wonder of it all and 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 let it lead to a deeper uh, and more awesome worship, uh, but I'm not going to try to be on top of it. Right. So uh, another thing I was I was thinking about is um, and I'm sure you you've run into this question plenty of times. How do you have divine simplicity? And I guess we could define that because I don't think we did earlier. What, yet there being distinctions in the persons. How, how do you explain that? Yeah, right. Uh, well, the word simple or simplicity has a special technical meaning. We talked, I appreciate the fact you brought up the issue of technical terms already. So you say, look, this is a technical term, right? Because if you just say God is simple, that sounds as if, oh, it's easy to master him. It's easy to completely understand him. It's kind of like saying, uh, you know, a, a baby's toy is simple, right? But no, that's not what it means. It, it's the opposite of complex. And the complex means in parts. It's the opposite of being composite. It, really, complex is not the right word. I should have used the, started with the word composite. So yeah, um, uh, let's take the example of a pencil. Right? So a pencil has a lead and it has a wooden shaft. And it has an eraser typically on the top and it has maybe a little band, right? Well, if you took the thing apart, you could decompose it into the, the eraser and the lead and so on, and you would have parts. Right. right. So the pencil is a composite object, meaning that it's it's made out of these distinct parts. And if you went to the you know place where they manufacture pencils, you could see the, the thing being done, right? And the parts being put together. So when you say God is simple, what is meant is God is not composed of parts. Now, I think that's the most obvious thing in the world because to be composed in parts is to be mean that you came from somewhere else. Right, right. Right, <laughs> right? but God is ultimate. That's part of, you might say, even the definition. What we mean by God is the ultimate source for everything else. The right. person now, not just abstract. And so it's really a kind of impossibility even to contemplate the idea that he would be composed of parts. There would be something behind him, you know, right? So, so who is it, right? Who is going to put God together out of the parts, right? It's just absurd to ask the question because there would have to be another God behind God, right? And that, that misses the whole point. Right, right, right. God's declaring that he is the absolute Lord and, and beginning for everything else. So, so he can't be composed of parts and he can't be decomposed afterwards, right? So you take the pencil apart, I, I imagine that kind of thing. You say, no, you can't take God apart because there's only one of him, right? And you can't even contemplate subtracting one person out of the Godhead. Now that's the thing about the three persons. The three persons are not three parts. I and mean, people can make, it's a kind of silly mistake or ghastly mistake if, if people are serious about it. That the three persons are not three parts of God because a part is less than the whole, right? Mm -hmm. the, 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 uh, the lead in the pencil is not the whole pencil, but each person is the whole God. He is God, not part of God. And that's the mystery. You, you see, you have, if you try to picture God using a pencil, it's not going to work. <laughs> because again, nothing in creation is going to match it. So what that means is that we have to have the distinctions between persons because the Bible teaches them, right? Not because, and there are people who make mistakes the other way, of abstractly, autonomously, that is, as if their minds were ultimate, trying to reason what is a perfect being like. And they conclude that the perfect being is simple. And then they conclude that it can't be the Trinity. 
Well, their problem is not with the Trinity. Their problem is with themselves, right? Because they've tried to be God. Right, 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 right. right. So, it's, but the Trinity is not a God with three parts, right? It's a God, each person of which is fully God. And that's unique. But, but that means that the simplicity of God must be understood in that light, right? It's not something that we shove down the throat of God, so to speak, as if anybody could, right? But the temptation is to play God and say, well, simplicity means that it's all unity and no diversity, no distinctions, and therefore I reject the doctrine of the Trinity. Wow. And the history of philosophy is full of this kind of thing. Why? Because sin is in the world. Because people want to be autonomous. They want to run their minds in their own ways and not submit to God talking to them in his way. And so they run off with all these false views of God. So in the Bible, the simplicity of God is closely related to his absoluteness, right? The fact that he's absolute means you can't cut him in pieces. You can't divide him up. Even conceptually, you can't because, because uh, all his attributes belong together. But it has to be consistent with the distinction between the three persons. Why? Because God teaches the distinctions as much as he teaches the unity of the one God. Wow. That's good. That was, that was really good. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. Um, <clears throat> so we have some submitted questions uh, from uh, Nick who says, well, before I get to that, let me see. Um, well, I guess I'll ask. Nick, Nick asks, does God have, and this is a separate subject, but we are talking about God here. So that does God have propositional knowledge or not? How should we view God's knowledge? Yeah, I would say he does. If what you mean by propositional knowledge is he knows truths. He knows that two plus two is equal to four. Uh, he knows that I'm sitting here in my study at home. He knows all those, you know, whatever we come up with, right? That's the truth. Then he knows it. So if that's what you mean by propositional truth, okay. But but actually there is a little bit of complexity underneath the surface and 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 sometimes it's you could wish that you know I could sit down with one of these people and discuss whether there's something behind the question. Uh, because the idea of propositions is an old one. And uh, excuse me, it goes back to Aristotle's uh, development of formal logic or, or propositional, uh, well, really of predicate logic, but, and, but Aristotle made some mistakes, I believe. And I discuss those in my book called Logic, uh, the God-Centered Approach to the Foundation of Western Thought. So you, if you want, you can look there and, and see what I say about propositions, because Proposition all, sometimes means, in the context of formal logic, things that are totally isolated from everything else. Well, the truths that God knows are not totally isolated, right? They belong to the one God. So you can't uh, to, to, to picture things as totally isolated as a kind of idealization. So there's, there's issues in the background there, but basically, yes, right? God knows whatever is true. Right. So uh, I didn't. Even, I didn't even bring this up earlier, but you have a background in mathematics. How does that help you uh, as you write some of these books? I have right next to me. Let me show you. So I have the mystery of the Trinity. Um, I have, which is Theophany, which is going to be the next book that I dive into, and then Knowing and the Trinity. And of course, you mentioned your your book on logic. And so, so how how does that background kind of help you in, in writing these books, or how is it enhanced? Uh, the way that you think or, or view these issues? Yes, well, people have asked that before. And I, I, first of all, I like to stress the fact, uh, look, it's God speaking to us in the scripture and redeeming us through Christ that transforms everything else. So the fundamental direction of movement is from God and, and Christ and his word in the Bible outward to every 
area of academic study. And those areas include logic, include mathematics. It does so happen that I studied logic in grad school uh, and I majored in, in mathematics. I love mathematics and I love the formal logic. Uh, but I did those things before I knew I was going to write books about them. <laughs> but I ended up writing books about them because I think it, they're one of the last areas that people think have anything to do with God. And they're, they're seen by people as being kind of neutral area of logic. Once you agree that two plus two is equal to four, and it doesn't matter whether God exists, uh, everybody can agree with that. Well, it does matter, I think, that God exists even there. So I try to go into those things and to show how God is upholding the truth even in, in areas like that. But the, the, uh, the reason for my doing that is because Christ has to be Lord of all of life. He's Lord of everything. He's Lord of every thought you ever have. And, and so we can't pretend that there are these areas where we can just get away with running our own show. Right. Yeah, that sounds very presuppositional. I, I haven't had the chance to look at it yet, but you have a section on, on presuppositional arguments. Um, so I guess, I mean, I, oh, this is, I don't even know if you can give a short answer on this, but, but uh, why are you a presuppositionalist? Oh, yeah, well, I had the, a, a gift of God that he brought me as a student to Westminster Seminary. And I, even before that, I began reading some literature that introduced me to it. But I think there are many misunderstandings of presuppositionalism. So I could wish that uh, people could come to Westminster and, and, and learn it in a robust atmosphere. Because it, what it's really about is, if you're a Christian believer, then your loyalty is to Christ. And you can't set that aside anytime you engage in, in discussions with unbelievers. You can't pretend that you're neutral. And you can't pretend that, that they're neutral either. Because if they're not for Christ, they're against him. Jesus himself says that. So we're in a religious conflict. It's, it's not a conflict between flesh and blood. But he pins principalities and powers, as God says in in Ephesians 6, uh, 10 and following. So there's something to remember so that you don't, you know, needlessly get mad at other people, right? Because they're captive to Satan at some level. If they're not believers in Christ, then they're, they're in the, uh, the dark. They're, they're either living, <clears throat> living under the control of the world as an evil system or under the control of Christ. And, and so we go with an understanding of that spiritual condition. Now, in that context, we can present all kinds of things that the Bible talks about. It talks about evidence for the resurrection. It talks about the miracles. It talks about prophecies. There are many, many evidences confirming that the Bible is true and that Jesus is who he says he is. But that's in the context of realizing that I'm a Christian believer. I'm not neutral. And one of the problems is the temptation to pretend that you could be neutral. To pretend that these spiritual issues aren't there all the time. Right? And, and then in addressing other people in the world, I know they're already sinners. I know that they know God because the Bible tells me. But they're going to suppress it. And, you know, they may claim to be atheists, and they may uh, claim to be worshipers of, of, uh, of the Muslim God and the Mormons God's plural and or whatever, right? But whatever, wherever they are, uh, they're, they're uh, sinners who need to be saved by grace. So it's a fundamental uh, understanding of who we are as persons and who God is and how he's revealed himself. It's the coloring and it, uh, of the entire way that you approach uh, apologetics discussions in the world. Right. And it allows for many specific topics to be discussed, but they're all discussed within an environment where you keep remembering, I belong to Christ. I'm, I'm here to present the truth about Christ as something 
that is not probable, but that is certain and that has divine right. power. Thank you, Lord. Bring about change in other people through the work of the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Amen. Uh, this the sire wants to know um, uh, what are he says. Let me see if I can put this up here. There, the question is, uh, what are his thoughts on using logics that logic that that accept contradictions in order to answer issues with the Trinity? No, I think that's confusing. You don't talk about accepting contradictions. God, God does not accept contradictions. God accepts truth, <laughs> right? And so I think it's better to talk about God is consistent with himself because he's God, right? And we are following him, then we will try to be consistent with who he is. But the consistency is defined by him and not by a human system of logic. Yeah, I, I like that. Uh, Irenic says, and you mentioned this earlier, he says, um, with the lack of anyone having a uniform understanding throughout church history, how confident can any one person be uh, that they have arrived at correct view of things concerning all the ins and uh, ins and outs of uh, this doctrine. Right. Uh, there's a wonderful pair of verses in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 18 and 19. The path of the righteous is like the light of dawn, which shines brighter and brighter until full day. Now, if you think you're righteous in yourself, you're mistaken, <laughs> right? But when we begin following Christ, he declares us to be righteous with his righteousness, and then we begin to walk in the way of righteousness. So if you're a Christian believer, this verse is for you. You are on the path of the righteous. What happens? It's like the light of dawn. It doesn't mean you know everything right away, but it shines brighter and brighter as you go on in the Christian life and you continue to read your Bible. Now it starts with a central thing. Do you believe that Christ is the light of the world? Do you believe that he was died for your sins and was raised to life to justify you? That's said in the Bible, right? So you believe that. You believe what it's clear. You start with that. And then you work out from there to the things that are less central. And you have to be patient. You have to learn Christian humility, in other words, right? Of saying, I don't know everything, right? I've got to continue to read my Bible. I've got to continue to try to sort things through, asking God every day to help me. Then the next verse says, the way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know over what they stumble. And if you are somewhere in the Western world today, the, the, the uh, lights of culture are pretty dark, especially of elite culture. There's a lot of confusion. And it's easy to feel in that situation. I don't know what's heads up. I don't know what's right and wrong. Well, all the more reason to choose the path of the righteous. In other words, the path that Christ has marked out by himself dying and being raised to life and then saying, follow me, follow me, right? Follow me as a savior, follow me as a Lord Amen. and you will know the truth. Amen. So, uh, let's see here. Um, <clears throat> yeah, Irenic seems to think that uh, the doctrine of the Trinity should maybe be viewed as something in a Christian liberty uh, kind of context because uh, of the lack of uniformity within church history or um, you brought up the fact that do, technical terms don't need to be used, but of course there, there's summaries of what the Bible teaches. Um, do you think the doctrine of the Trinity is a is up to Christian liberty? No, absolutely not. 
And it's easy to exaggerate the differences in the course of her church history. There was struggle for several centuries in the early church to get this doctrine right. It was not because people didn't know that Christ was God, but they were struggling over against deviations, right? And struggling against false teachers. And it took several centuries to work it all out and to come to an expression of the truth that was sufficiently clear and sufficiently precise and sufficiently summarized the various aspects of biblical teaching so that it satisfied the godly leaders of the church. And that, that's we have that now in what are called the ecumenical creeds, the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, Constantinopolitan Creed, the, the formulation of Chalcedon. So, so those are valuable. Uh, but since then, the church, both West and East, for the most part, has been on target with those same creeds, <laughs> right? That, that there isn't a lot of, of um, uh, d discussion or deviation or dispute that they got it right. Uh, but things have changed primarily with the coming of the Enlightenment, because the Enlightenment as an intellectual movement began to, to uh, champion the use of reason as the primary tool by which we would have human agreement. And the, that uh, movement penetrated into the church itself. And so now within groups that call themselves churches, there is much confusion, there's much diversity of claims and much denying of the Trinity uh, because of the influence of the Enlightenment. So you have to go back before the Enlightenment to see the fact, yeah, it was pretty clear, right? But it can seem unclear today because the cultural voices around us are so confusing. But if you want clarity, it has to be ultimately from the Bible itself. But again, I'd recommend, well, I hope my own book can be a help, but certainly also John Owen, right? This is now three uh, or, or more centuries before us. He wrote it up uh, from the Bible itself and basically demonstrated the Bible teaches the doctrine of the Trinity. Nobody has ever been able to destroy his arguments. Amen. And oh yeah, the liberty issue. Look, it's because it's soul destroying. If you don't hold to the doctrine of the Trinity, now there can be people who are, you know, still learning, right? This kind of innocence. But if people are rebelling against it and teaching the opposite, they're going to destroy people's souls if they could. And so that has to be stopped. It can't be a matter of Christian liberty, not only because the Bible is clear, but wow. also because of its centrality to the message of salvation. If Christ is not God, then we can't worship him and he can't save us. Wow. That simple. So I, I have to ask, because I'm seeing in, in some of these diagrams, I had a photo, if I could get it up here. Um, I don't think I'll pull it up, but I, I will just show you in, 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 in your, your book here. You have uh, uh, God, the Father, unity. Let me see if I can get that display. You have these. Uh, and, and of course, don't mind the handwriting. It's not intelligible at this point. Um, <clears throat> but it, it seems to be, I, I think you guys, um, you, you and John Frame um, talk about triperspectivalism. Could you explain sort of what that is and and, and how you... Uh, the so you have God the Father, uh, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, which you see so the God the Holy Spirit that provides the context, uh, God the Son provides diversity, and God the Father unity. Can you explain what that means exactly and also try perspectivalism? Well, that's a big question, and, uh, and maybe I should direct people to my books uh, or for John Frame at the, the website frame hyphen poetress dot org. Uh, he has a thing called a primer 
on perspectivalism, which is, I think, one of the simplest introductions. Okay. Uh, and I have a book called Symphonic Theology. Uh, but but we, we introduce triads of perspectives to some extent just to help people. So, for instance, in Christian ethics and Christian living, everybody confronts situations where they don't know what to do, uh, where there are hard decisions that have to be made. So Frame recommends you use three perspectives. What is called a normative perspective, where you look at what does the Bible say, what are the norms from God, because God is the standard for right and wrong. And second, the situational perspective, you look at the situation and try to discern what would promote the glory of God uh, in this situation, right? If I, so the Bible says, love your neighbor as yourself, right? So that's a commandment, that's a norm. Then I look at my neighbor, what does he need, right? Well, he needs the gospel, right? So, so that's one thing I could do to, to love my neighbor, right? But I have to look at his situation of what he needs. And the third perspective is called the existential perspective or sometimes the personal perspective because it's a perspective on inward motives. So my attitude should be right, right? Am I approaching my neighbor because I want to win an argument, right? Or because I genuinely have a concern for him and, and his salvation. So, so all three of those things go together. And actually, they all lead to one another. And because if we say the norm is that love our neighbors ourself, right? That's a commandment of Jesus then it's going to force us to pay attention to the situation. So we're going to end up using the situational perspective. It's going to force us to pay attention to our, our, our motives, which have to be loving motives. And then likewise, if we start with a situation, well, the most important piece in the situation is God. He's the most important one to reckon with. And if we reckon with him, then we have to say, well, he's he provides us with the norms. You see, so I've got to... I'm forced into using the normative perspective. So the three are actually coalesce in a way that they don't. In non-Christian ethics, typically one of those things is chosen excluding the other. Because what happens is you end up worshiping, worshiping the creature again, right? You, you establish something in the world, a norm or situation in the world in order to avoid serving God. So those are three perspectives. And Frame also wondered whether they weren't a kind of reflection somehow of the Trinitarian character of God. Wow. And eventually, yeah. he decided, yes, they were. Now, you have to be careful about that because these three perspectives are not the three persons. They're a kind of reflection, a kind of display, <laughs> right, at a practical level. Right. Yeah, that, that book... Uh, in knowing in the Trinity, I do discuss a number of triads. And I do try to show that they reflect the Trinity. Uh, awesome, awesome, awesome. Yeah, that this is going to be the next book that I dive into. So either this or Theophany, I'll, I'll, I'll debate it and figure it out. Um, uh, so the, the sire has, this is a, seems a really simple question. He says, uh, what issue have you found the most challenging to write on? Oh, yeah. Um, I'm thinking what was the hardest book that he ever wrote? Uh, it may be this latest one. Writing on the Trinity is like nothing else because the trinity is mysterious right because you're dealing with ultimate things about god so when you write do you find yourself uh, refreshing yourself in things that you know or do you find that you're you're constantly tweaking and correcting and and thinking oh, oh maybe i should say it this way well <laughs> i do go through several drafts <laughs> and it depends on the book too but um, as I assess the gifts that God has given to me, I don't think I'm a great writer. I, I'm, not a, I'm not a wordsmith who 
who can write artistically. There's some people I, I really admire the people who can do that. It's, it's God hasn't given me those kinds of gifts. So I don't keep going over and over the wording in that way. Now I have my wife read the book and she reads it as if she were the most hostile reader you could imagine trying to catch me in heresies and errors and, and <laughs> she but she does it of course out of love for me to protect me and i, I so much appreciate uh, her wanting to do that and so so that that makes me reword things to try to make them clearer wow but, but the main thing that i think god has given me is he gives me ideas and so then i write them up but also I attempt to write clearly because I'm not an artist. I'm not a right wordsmith. So that, so that I, the, the, the only thing I'm left with is say, well, I can, can I at least say this in a simple and clear way, right? And if I can, then that will make up for some of the lack of artistry that, that uh, that you know i admire in others but it just it, there's not a great deal with me well brother i think that uh writing in a way that is clear is so helpful for the church today and and every time i told somebody i said i'm reading the mystery of the trinity and it's a 700 page book and like that's got to be really dense and i go no it's actually easy to understand i, I didn't find myself questioning too many things i thought okay let me keep reading let me keep reading so if there's one thing i mean I mean, what's the point of writing if no one understands it? So it's a good thing that people understand. So uh, we we have um, Dr. Poythers kind of condescending to us now, uh, and, and writing and writing in these books. So that that that's that's good. Um, so Ryan wants to know um, about the term eternity. You you wrote about this. I actually just got into this section uh, about um, God being outside of time. And, and so, so uh, Ryan doesn't find that term helpful. Um, so how do we view God in him being in time, out of time? Is he Lord of time? How do we view that? Yes, uh, it's a good question. But one of the difficulties here is, again, the mystery of who God is, that he's the infinite creator God. And so if you talk about time, you, typically, we're thinking of things in the world. So we're thinking there's a there's an oak tree out in my front yard that's been growing for years and years, right? And over over time, you know, it it grows, it puts on leaves, and it shed leaves once a year, and it gets bigger gradually, right? So all those things are happening in time. But we can't compare that to God because God doesn't grow like an oak oak tree, right? He doesn't turn into something. Uh, bigger or with with greater potential than what he had before. So the whole business of our experience of time is related to this created order that God has crafted and He's put us in. And and when we try to picture God, uh, it's easy to, again to make the mistake of either He's included as another a human-like person alongside of us. Now, Jesus did take on human nature, right? So in that respect, he is alongside of us. He's our elder brother. But if you talk about God uh, in his divinity, he's not simply alongside of us uh, as a buddy-buddy on the same level. Right. Rather, he's superior to us. And if we say that he's in time, that could mean simply that he's involved in the world which he certainly is, right? So this oak tree that was growing, everything in it, all the minute molecular processes and all the growth from year to year, God controlled that. He brought it about. He makes grass to grow for the cattle, it says in Psalm 104, verse 14. There's an intimacy of God's involvement in the world. He's in the world in that sense. He's involved, right? But if I say he's in the world, the danger would be and here's the non-Christian alternative, that he's trapped inside the world, that he's enclosed in the world. And then you've brought him down to be just another creature, maybe you know, a more powerful creature, 
right? Maybe a bigger creature, but he's still, you're picturing him as if he were just a creature alongside of us. On the other hand, if you say he's outside of time, then that can make you think that he's remote, right? So he's way off there somewhere, and you picture it spatially outside of, right? You picture it spatially, which is, again, part of the limitations, right, of our being embedded in a creator order. So you picture him as being out there somewhere and totally uninvolved, which is not scriptural, right? So what do you say? <laughs> And here I go back and I say, well, certainly we, we should say what the Bible says. Right? And in Psalm 102, near the end, well, the whole psalm is, is uh, relevant. Because the whole psalm talks about it's, it's partly a prayer. It's partly petitioning God to act in the world, which is clear, right, that he is, in, he is involved and he can do as he pleases in the world. Near the end, it said, the, the, the heavens and the, shall perish, but you are the same. Right. And and so it's saying God is is an, even compared to the most enduring things, right? So the oak tree is going to eventually die. But the earth will remain for a long long time until Christ returns, right? So but even those things of the most permanent, it's nothing in comparison with you are the same and your years have no end. Now, this is a it's a picture, right. basically, of the magnificence of God in his relation to time. He's not like us. But he does rule time. And he does rule all the events in time. And each event is determined to happen at exactly the point in time where he's planned it to happen. So the, the whole of time is his playing field, you might say, right? But not so that he's captured and limited in the way that a creature is. Right. So uh, let, me, let me get uh, two more questions here. I'm, I'm trying not to compete with people in having the longest interview. <laughs> so let me let me see if we can wrap this up here with. Uh, uh, let me see. Um, <clears throat> I think I'll. I think this one's very simple. Um, when we think about the Trinity, uh, how did the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, were, how were they relating before creation? If, if we can think about that, that's going to be the, the one question. And then we can look at, uh, this one's going to be a little bit more complicated, so we can, we can do that one second. Okay, so uh, there is one God, and there are three persons even before the world was made. There's no change in that just because the world was made. And those, the, and God is eternally active. And you can see it in the relation of the persons of the Trinity that the Father loves the Son. That's John 3, 34 and 35. And uh, the Father speaks the word. That's John 1, 1. And the Holy Spirit is like the breath of God going out with the word. And that's Ezekiel 37, although it's in the context of redemption. But we can infer that there's a, a pattern even beyond redemption. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2.10, the Holy Spirit searches the depths of God. That's an activity, right? It's all mysterious, but it's going on. Those activities of the persons are going on forever, and they continue to go on then once God has made the world. Okay. And then uh, we'll, we'll end with uh, the Sire's question here, which is, what's your thoughts on using Reformed epistemology to show Christians are warranted in trusting the biblical witness? Uh well, Reformed Episcopology can mean more than one thing. The term, I believe, is sometimes used as a technical term to talk about the views of Alvin Plantiga and Nicholas Walterstorff, um, who are, um, you know, very insightful and, and gifted gentlemen, but with whom I don't always agree. <laughs> 
So I would rather that people say reformed epistemology is first of all a Christian epistemology that is instructed by the Bible, right? And that admits that we are creatures. And that's that's going to have implications now. Oh yeah, is it warranted to believe? Yeah, that's part of the question, right? But but the Bible uh, indicates that everybody already knows God, Romans one, uh, eighteen to twenty three. It's not a struggle as to whether God exists, but you already know that he exists and you suppress it. That's the problem. Right now, however you construe that, and there's mystery of it. That passage doesn't explain everything about it. But it's not in a vacuum. It's in the, in the context of the witness of created things. Right, that those things show the eternal power and divine nature of God, according to Romans 1. So that can be the starting point for discussing with a, with an unbeliever, but the unbeliever will, in some way or another, try to escape, right? Either with false religion, other gods, or atheism as a substitute for religion, or whatever it is. Uh, that is so so we, we have to come to that person, as I mentioned before, <clears throat> understanding that he's a sinner who needs to hear the gospel. And the fundamental thing is the gospel, the, the work of God in Christ, against the background of the fact that God is creator of the whole world. Now, you can explain that to somebody who doesn't believe a word of it. But he may believe after you've explained it because the Holy Spirit can work in his heart. Now, if he argues against you, then one of the, there's many ways of answering those arguments. But one of the ways can be to say, what ground do you stand on? What is your basis for argument? Van Til uses a, an example where he pictures himself as talking to an unbeliever. And he says, you know, we're having an argument about the existence of God or maybe about the deity of Christ, whatever it is. He says, we can carry on this argument for a long time, uh, but it's as if we were arguing about the existence of air. We could imagine an argument going on about that, right? Now, I say air exists and you say air does not exist. But all the time we're using air. You can't get along without it to conduct the argument, right? You have to be able to breathe. You have to be able to talk. Well, that's the way God is. And so people's basic problem is spiritual. Of course, you know, we can use our minds and, and call on other people to use our minds. Uh, but, but we've got to understand we're going to encounter resistance. And that resistance is irrational. It hasn't got a proper basis. And people have got not grounds outside of God for their notions of right and wrong and their notions of true and false. Uh, there's actually an argument I present in, uh, in Redeeming Science uh, fairly far in about the nature of truth, that, that truth, the very nature of truth shows that God exists. Wow. Oh. Yeah, let me put that there. Um, do you have time for just one more question about the about Jesus and the law of non-contradiction? Okay. All right. So the, the question that Smoking Tire uh, asked, and the reason I want to ask this is because I um, just talked to a Muslim about this last night. Um, does Jesus break the law of non-contradiction by being fully man and fully God, all in the one, in the one person of the Son? Yes, and the answer is no, he does not. And, and uh Christian doctrine, Orthodox doctrine, has said since the Council of Chalcedon or Chalcedon, there is one person with two natures, right? So th there's no contradiction because the two natures are distinct and not confused, that they belong together in one person. Now, uh, once again, in the background, maybe certain conceptions of the law of non-contradiction, which are biased by human uh, sin uh, that it penetrates into the mind. So I have to refer people, to, for instance, to my book on logic, uh, where, where I argue that logic basically is based on the Trinity too. <laughs> so, 
So, so you, it's not that we abandon logic, it's that we understand it with reference to its deepest roots. All right. Amen. All right. Well, Dr. Porkers, thank you for doing this, guys. Thank you for listening to Faith and Film, the only Christian podcast where you can mix movies with faith. I'm going to end the broadcast now here.